My name is Alex Chehorsky. I'm Regina Ravazova. We belong to two different generations. We're former refugees. I've served and worked in two armies, Russian and American. And I was among civilians trapped in a war at the age of seven. I am a former Putin's classmate. I'm a mother of three. We are now watching the tragedy of Ukraine unfold in front of our eyes. Watching from across the ocean, it is a distant war, yet very personal. Hi, Alex. How are you doing? How are you? I'm fine. How are you? So today we decided to talk a little bit about, let me ask you this. Let me start from this, right? We're all now focused on what's going on in Europe, specifically in Ukraine. But forget about that for, for a second. So European continent, right? So from a standpoint of just a commoner, I visited it three, four years ago. Magnificent Europe, old, cultured, I don't know, bunch of tiny, medium and large countries, beautiful places to visit, amazing food, landscapes, and so on and so forth, right? But what's been happening over the past few decades, politically, economically, culturally, is for those that kind of follow it closer, right? With financial crisis, Brexit, some rise of some populism, and of course, the global pandemic that wasn't handled quite well there, let's put it that way. But amidst all of that, I mean, even before all of that, something interesting is happening that sort of is not that dramatic. I mean, not for the outside world. The bubble of complacency is bursting. Some people say it bursts in 2005. Some people say it bursts in 2008, but it it bursts. And when we were getting ready for this episode, I remember you mentioned something about that complacency. What was the term that you used? These pale people, (laughs) if I translate it, right? So let's start from there. What was going on for the past decades on that continent that now is impacting the lives of probably the rest of the world? Uh, that is a precisely what uh, you and I meant when we called it Casablanca perspective, because this is what we do, right? We're sitting in a Casablanca in Morocco, so to speak, virtual Morocco, right? United States. And we're watching what's going on in a different continent. And we are not as much affected by the everyday situations as of the trends, you know, the longer trends. And we're asking ourselves what more deep trends we are facing and uh, how this will change the life in basically three different areas in uh, Europe, uh, in the United States, and in Russia. That war in Ukraine showed us that tectonic changes, you know, the huge changes are happening and it will be very, in my opinion, interesting and useful to try to analyze it. My opinion is that the interesting angle here is to look at what was happening. Let's start with Europe. Look what was happening in Europe and in the world in general, in a democratic world, in a Western world, in the past 30 years after the Soviet Union fell apart. What we watched in my opinion, the most interesting was that kind of almost even abrupt declination of the quality of political leaders. Interesting. Tell me more about it. Yeah, well, you remember, we saw people like Reagan, like Thatcher, like Mitterrand, really strong. I don't like the word strong because it has now, you know, with Putin and everything else, it has a different connotation, but determined, philosophically Definitely deep, knowledgeable leaders on the both sides uh, of the Western world, American and European. And uh, we get used to generations of leaders like that. And then suddenly, after the Soviet Union fell apart, we started to see declining. And people were talking about the end of history, which is, in my opinion, is a ridiculous even the terminology is ridiculous. You mean the, the end of history? Of- yeah, by Fukuyama, at, you know, the end of history. That That's it. There will be no more history. We're just now, you know, moving into happy times. There will be no more wars, no more conflicts. The history is over. Now we're just sailing. That was basically the, the feeling. And uh, 
we saw the leaders and the countries squabble, you know, over little things. I think that the France and Germany are the best examples today, especially when uh, people are seriously discussing the details of a little bit of these sanctions and these sanctions. We thought that, you know, the dead bodies in Bucha and other places will wake them up. And to a certain extent, that did happen, but not really. And at the same time, we see the race, the beginning of the race, of a new leadership in Eastern Europe, in England. Uh, the people who came from that same material that we used to see in the Western countries, in the true Western countries, in the old Europe. The old Europe today is, in my opinion, completely falling apart. I am watching Macron. You know, I studied French. I, I don't really speak well French, but I studied French history, and I studied French language, and, inter- and you can call me... At, at a certain point, a francophone. But what happens today with France is a degradation of, of moral and humanistic values that I never thought I would be witnessing. So my point is that I'm pretty sure that we were given a cold shower, a uh, very cold shower, I should say. But in time, we will see a total overhaul of a European and Western politics, of the new generation of leaders that will come back to be determined, to be strategic, to address real questions instead of inventing one you know, problem after another, just pulling them out of the thin air. I am not going to say if it's good or bad, but it is definitely what serious danger what serious situation creates in the world. It reminds us that we are not just baboons sitting on a baobabs and eating bananas. We have to address serious, deep issues, and we have to take care of this world for our children and for children of our pe- of other people. So let me go back a little bit, Sasha. So the, the leaders of the past, those leaders with long-term goals in mind, determined, forward thinking, smart, very strategic. Those were gone decades ago. What what happened there? They were not more demanded by the electorate. The electorate bought into the idea that dangerous times are over, that the dictators are gone, that the threat of the nuclear war is gone. And now it's time to sell, to buy, and uh, basically a hedonistic time. It's the same thing as the English, after the war, kicked Churchill out. You know, you were a good guy. You know, you saved us. But we don't need you anymore because now it's peace and now it's going to be everything is going to be okay. Uh, Serious, determined, deep people are needed in a time of need. After the time of need, the population want easy life and they talk themselves into electing people who will tell them that the life is easy, who would make that life, they hope, easy, which never happens. It's a relaxation. It's a time of an intellectual, physical relaxation. I see, I see. Okay, I'm I'm an old Europe. I've gone through wars, horrific wars. I just want to I just want a nice life. Exactly. Absolutely. And I don't want and I don't want people who remind me of serious things. They make life harder. They make me think about things that are, you know, uncomfortable for Unpleasant, me. Unpleasant, yes. And then Mr. Putin comes and starts to casually talk about tactical nuclear weapons. Casually. And everything changes overnight. In my opinion, this unity of the West that we saw, which is unprecedented, that unity came actually at the beginning, and it came very early, if you remember, right? We didn't see the you know the corpses in Bucha when it said when it all happened, when the big packages of uh, sanctions start to coming. In my opinion, it happened because of that casual mentioning of tactical nuclear weapons 
by Russian government and by Russian propaganda. Somehow, these words, the easiness with which they were used, the casual way how they were used, touched a button in many, many people's lives, and the people understood that yesterday was yesterday and today is today, because there's somebody in the world who dares to casually, but determiningly, to talk about possibility of a nuclear attack. Maybe not, you know, the overall nuclear attack, but any nuclear attack. And that changed so much that suddenly all these small differences between politics and that, uh, you know, dilemma whether we should, you know, sell Russia the, the Mercedeses or whether we should give Ukrainian weapons, it was resolved almost on the spot. So Putin starts a war. Actually, one of his hopes was that divided West. Somehow, everything just got together. they are businesses that were making decisions before their governments. Right. They're, they're individuals. And that, in my opinion, had two reasons. First, there was a war in the midst of Europe. It's a very strong feeling for the Europeans because Europe, for the last well, several decades was a, quite a peaceful place, and everybody gets used to that. And then suddenly, you have refugees coming, and that these refugees look like you. They don't look like you know they're coming from the Middle East. They don't look like they're coming from Africa, which kind of people used to, you know, that's a land of problems. No. These are blue-eyed, you know, the, the fair children uh, crying, coming from all over the place in Europe. That's one thing. And the casual mentioning of uh, weapons of mass destruction, that was another thing. Like a wind, you know, it just blew all that, you know, small, not important hogwash away. And we saw the naked landscape of a war in the middle of of, of Europe and uh, a big country completely under the propaganda, uh, war propaganda, that is uh, used to speak about nuclear weapons as not only should be used, but discussion is when we use it, not should we use it, but when we use it and how we use it. You know, it's interesting. Putin, from the early 2000s, since he came to power, was choking consistently, strategically, choking first media and then continued until until today. Like, And, and he keeps going. Businesses, there are no independent businesses, there are no independent media in Russia. Political opposition is, you know, there's there's almost none within Russia, right? For 22 years, you know, no one kind of cared. Let's do business as usual, you know, pragmatic West, remember? By the way, I have to tell you, being a little bit older than you, that it was not the case in 60s and 70s. You know, it, it was kind of business, a little bit of a business as usual, but at the same time, Political parties and political leadership was watching Russia's hawks. Nothing was forgiven, at least in terms of discussions, you know, in terms of uh, political life. When Russia was doing something dangerous, it was always discussed. It was quite vigorously debated. And then after the, you know, destruction of Soviet, not destruction, but after the Soviet Union fell apart and the new generation of politicians came, they kind of shied away from that. So Russia was doing, well, less or maybe aggressive things that they were doing during the communist time. But nevertheless, you know, the war with uh, the war with Georgia, the war with Moldova, it was business as usual for the Russia. But the world was kind of forgiving. Nobody right, wants right. to talk about this because, again, it would disrupt, you know, the business. But the leaders of the previous generation also disrupted the business and quite successfully they said, you know what? Yes, we're building that gas pipelines, but if you're going to do this, we're going to stop. And they did. And this time it was Madame Merkel who would say, oh, no, you know, let's do a little bit more. No, we're going to talk to him. We're going to. And that, of course just ended the way it's ended. In my opinion, Madame Merkel, who is a probably a wonderful and you know kind and nice individual, but she was 
throwing the gasoline on the uh, flames. I hope without realizing it. But there is also a possibility that for her and for the you know German politicians, especially for the Germans, you know the money that they were making with Russia was far too important, and that a situation like that can happen in Germany of all countries, the country who should smell any fascist tendencies from 100,000 miles. As a fact, as of today, Germany is the last. Germany is reluctant. Germany is following the trend of helping Ukraine, but doing it reluctantly and doing it dragging their feet. And even when they make serious accusations of Russia and when they promise weapons and everything else, it's still, even in their words, you feel that reluctance, you know, that saving of the last five yards, you know, like maybe we're going to sell another half a million Mercedes there. I was stunned. My mother is Jewish and uh, my mother's mother's side of the family, they, they were German Jews and they, all of them, they completely were disappeared during the World War II. They lived in Germany. I was always thinking that they learned so much and they suffered so much and they suffered so much guilt and everything else that, you know, these organs with which a nation feels wrong should be more sensitive. I am stunned and I am flabbergasted how at the very end it turned out not that way. We started talking about the leadership in Europe. I have this question for you, Sash. We, we're finding ourselves in, in the midst of war right now. With everything that's going on, with all the awakening, consolidation, heavy sanctions, just, you know, doing morally right things are so, so important. So we're finding ourselves in this situation where all these processes are happening on different scale, but they're happening are these new leaders of Europe emerging? And if they're emerging, are they emerging in... They're not emerging in West Europe. They're not emerging in Germany. They're not... Emer like, what is happening there? I disagree with you. They are emerging. They're not emerging in France and Germany, at least for now. Although that lady, the new German... Um, what's the foreign affairs minister? She's pretty determined. But you see, I have to say something that I maybe blamed later, but I'll still do that. Both France and Germany were liberated by Americans and English. And basically, they have still, I think, a little bit of the old complexes that came with that liberation from outside. I don't know. Maybe I'm fantasizing. I don't have proof, you know, so to speak. When it comes to the Baltics and when it comes to the East European, I understand that much better because these people were under the Russian um, boot, military boot, and they still have that two generations who remember that. And they understand what the game is and they understand what they're risking. Look, remember Estonia was sending the rockets to Ukraine you know, almost immediately. And Estonia doesn't have that much weapons. So if they're doing this, they understood that they were not just grabbing them from the bottomless arsenals like you know England or the United States, but they're probably sending to Ukraine a good percentage of their active duty weapons. By you know, they were weakening themselves, but they understood immediately from day one that both from humanitarian point of view and strategic point of view, it is good for them, both as humans and both as soldiers to support Ukraine. Because if Ukraine will fall, the Baltics will be the next. Sure, sure. So, and, so, so and the is Poland, Poland will be, right, Of course, right. <laughs> of course. So, yeah. But I do see that, I that Italy is determined. So the Italian leadership is understanding that. So basically, other than Germany and France today, Europe is united in a way we've never seen them united. Is, is this going to foster a new a new type of leader in Europe? I hope so. I hope so. And I'm pretty sure that 
Again, being a big fan of friends, a really big fan of friends, French culture, you know, many French things. I just hope that this is, uh, I don't know, uh, you know, something that happened and that the, the French uh, citizens will see through and they will bring, you know, the new government and new political generations because France deserves that. France does not deserve Mr. Macron, who is, you know, running around Putin and uh, begging him, w watching that crazy situation, you know, with him, and it was, it was unbearable. I understand one thing. If France and Germany will not change the nature of their attitude in the world, in the right or wrong, with the good and evil, they will perish as cultures. Not as people, not as countries, as cultures. As the leaders, because remember, we're talking about leaders of a European civilization. We're talking about French literature. We're talking about German music. We're talking about the two nations who, well, together with others, but still, who were the centerpiece of, uh, of all the values of, uh, of the civilization, of a European and Western civilization, or what history today is of the Western world and European civilization. They just cannot afford, in my opinion, to disappear into the gray background. It's another war. A lot of people are saying, well, maybe it, it is going, maybe we already are in the third world war because we kind of, we kind of, you know, someone, someone participates not on the ground, but by some other means, you know, there are many countries involved nowadays, right? So that changes that complacency that's been going on for a while that changes those, I don't know, you call them pale people. <laughs> yeah. But I tell you what, I prefer to stay within traditional definitions of terminology, okay? A war is a war, and you've seen the war, and I've seen the war, and we know. We know it when we see it. So you can use the word war as a metaphor, but it's a very dangerous metaphor. Sure. A very sure. dangerous metaphor. Is there, Sash, anything else you would like to add? I would like to discuss, in our next one, I would like to discuss the ramifications for Russia, because that would be probably be a really a tectonic change after this whole thing will start to turn around. We discussed, you know, like a West today. I think we should also discuss the US and Russia. You and I live in, in America, and this is our country. And Russia is a country where we have a huge experience. And I think that some of people who listen to us may be interested in our perspective about this too. Otherwise, I think we kind of touched everything we wanted.